today's focus is going to be macroalgae. It's been a while since I've done a macroalgae focus video and I think it's worth an update. There are some things that I've learned in the last six months to a year after owning and running this macroalgae fish house, this nursery for all things macroalgae, which I think I haven't covered in any of my previous videos. So I'm going to go through some of the major points about keeping macroalgae and sort of update them for 2023. If you're wondering why this tank is a bit cloudier than the rest, it's because I cleaned one of my tubs over here and I didn't actually then siphon the dirty water out. So at the moment, that cloudy water is just sort of filtering through the entire system until it gets taken out by my canister. So while we're on the topic of filtration, we'll start with filtration for macroalgae. Now, as you know, or you may know, I use canister filters on all of my aquariums. But on this little nano aquarium, I don't have any kind of proper filtration. You might notice at the back, there is an overflow. It's got a little bit of filter floss in there just to stop the impeller getting clogged up. But essentially, this tank is unfiltered. So, in terms of filtration for your, your macroalgae aquarium, you don't technically need any. Um, the only reason this guy is in here is for some flow, because flow is really important. And also it just removes the surface scum from the top of the tank, which I hate. I hate all those oils and stuff that build up, so that's why he's in it. In terms of mechanical filtration, it's basically nothing. The main filtration in this tank is actually the substrate and the rocks for your biological filtration. And obviously the macroalgae itself is gonna be taking out waste products, nitrates and phosphates. In fact, I have to dose that into this tank, but we'll get on to dosing a little bit later. On my other systems, I do run canisters, but they are there mainly just for some mechanical filtration. So it really does depend on a case by case basis what your aquarium needs. This particular tank requires more filtration. I find that having the FX2 on it and there's another canister filter down here um, is what it needs. But as we just seen on the nano tank, it doesn't need that. So you can actually start a macroalgae aquarium completely filterless, a lot like you would do on some of these fancy fresh water tanks. So when it comes to skimmers, classically in a reef tank, most people would say yes, use a skimmer, but I haven't touched a skimmer ever on a macroalgae tank. Absolutely waste of time. You don't need a skimmer. Skimmers actually work against macroalgae. It pulls out too much of the stuff that macroalgae needs. And I find that it tends to sort of starve them out a little bit. You never get them to flourish as well as you could. Or at least in my case, it works better for me without a skimmer. That is a added expense, which you just don't need. A topic which comes up a lot when it comes to macroalgae is lighting. And I have done tons and tons of videos about different lights and also which lights I use on my macroalgae. Essentially, macroalgae are pretty tolerant of most aquarium lighting. I have found though, that the macroalgae that's under my Orphec lights, which are basically specced towards growing corals, doesn't grow particularly well or fast. It kind of stays at this level and I don't actually rate using bright blue coral lights to grow macroalgae. However, macroalgae will grow under pretty much any other type of light from 6,500K freshwater plant lights. And then I would say up to around 12,000 K sort of reef lights. That's what I've got on here, a bit of a mixture. So if I lift that up, we've got LEDs, which are 6,500, I think. We've got Aqua Blue 5050. So these are running at around 12,000 K. And then there's a couple of marine lights on there as well. And you might notice that I'm running a mixture of T5s and LEDs. And there is a reason for that. I do find that macroalgae grows better under T5s than it does under LEDs. Well, not all macroalgae, but certain types, like Botrycladia struggles under LEDs, or at least the LEDs that I've been using. But once you put it under some new T5s in sort of a reef or marine white spectra, they really get on quite well. The reason I'm using a hybrid is purely because of electricity costs. So the LEDs I've got on here, um, they grow macroalgae fine, but I find that the spectra isn't complete, so that's why I add the T5s and I use a mixture of the both 
just to reduce the electricity costs essentially. You can see a similar kind of setup here. We've got um, at the front, we've got a sort of normal white LED. Here we've got a fluval LED and then at the back we've got that 12,000K tube light as well. And that seems to work really well. In fact, since I um, changed over, because I wasn't always running the tube light, I was just using the LEDs. Since I've added that tube light, which was probably about two months ago, this macro algae has responded really well and actually started to grow a lot faster than it was. So I do think that having the T5s is a big boon for a macro algae. But not all macro algae respond to that, not all macro algae rely on that. This top row hasn't got any T5s and it hasn't had T5s for a long time. And this cryptonemia is doing absolutely fine under it, as is the Calerpa uh, in both ends. So it's a case by case basis, but I do think some species of macros do like that wide range of spectra that you get from the T5s. One thing that is very important when it comes to macroalgae is flow. This is one thing that I've learned over my macroalgae career is you need a good amount of flow. Not loads of flow, not tons of flow, um, probably not even as much as you would need for some coral systems, but a decent amount because if you don't, what tends to happen is you get sediments and things building up on your macroalgae, especially Botrycladia. Also, a lot of these species are tidal. They live in that zone where they get smashed about quite a bit. So if you want them to grow in a similar sort of format that they would in the wild, then having that flow is uh, how you replicate it. But as you can see, nothing too crazy, just a gentle, constant flow. I don't think you need a wave maker or, or anything like that, which rocks them back and forth, but you could try it, I guess wouldn't do them any harm. Now one thing that people do struggle with, and this is probably due to an availability issue, is actually um, overcrowding or species selection. Macroalgae doesn't like its neighbour. As much as we would like to create a tank that's just got every single species in it, and I have tried to put as many species in this tank as possible, you will find eventually that one or two will completely out-compete and dominate the others. It's a good example here. So this is Calerpa taxifolia, and this is Calerpa prolifera. Now, normally, one of these is gonna outcompete the other, and we can see that, because this one really isn't growing very well or fast, and this one has taken over like two thirds of the entire tank, so it's outcompeting that one. And it does it by taking space away, but it also does it by taking the nutrients faster. I don't know how or why, but you always find it in a macroalgae tank where some species will just dominate the other ones and it's not always the same way round either because normally this blue octos down here would grow faster and outcompete this hamillaris but in this case the mammillaris is winning although i've got to keep an eye on it because blue octodes can be a bit of a pest and actually i didn't add it to this tank it's, it's made its way in here on something else and um, i don't always add blue octos to tanks the reason is it can outcompete, and that's what's happening in this tank. I've got to be really careful. Blue Octodes, although it is lovely, and you can't really see the coloration in this video, but it is a nice blue color, it will spread throughout your tank. You can see it's on the little power head bit there. It's spreading over the rocks. It's kind of outcompeting that Xenia. It's made its way there. So eventually, you can end up with a, a problem with certain species, especially this one where it just goes nuts and about three four weeks ago this taxifolia was actually let's say taking up most of the tank you can see it in my previous videos and that went sexual died off well to explain it even further when this was growing like the clappers in this corner this blue octode was actually white because it wasn't getting enough nutrients again the taxifolia was grabbing all the nutrients the octodes couldn't get any and it was sort of barely hanging on. Since that went sexual and died back, this has now gone blue and has spread. So you kind of can see what I was talking about in just like real time there. Taxifolia was winning, it for some reason went sexual and now those nutrients and the space has been freed up and here we have the result. The octodes is starting to win 
the war of dominance over this aquarium. So let's talk about nutrients and adding ferts and things like that. People love to talk about this and uh, it's something I'm still working on myself because some of the times you can get a tank which has loads of nitrates and loads of phosphates but the macroalgae won't grow in it and then sometimes I do water tests on my tanks and there's zero phosphate and zero nitrate and the macroalgae looks the best I've ever seen it. So it is a bit of a balancing act and it is difficult to get it right and I'm still struggling on it. I'd say that one of the biggest factors, especially on this system, is alkalinity. Macroalgae will drag alkalinity down in your system. Now I think it's because 90% of the carbon, if I'm getting this right, that macroalgae needs to grow comes from the water so it comes out of the alkalinity so they gain a lot of their carbon from bicarbonate um, now if I'm wrong tell me I'm wrong but that's how I understand it that's why this system can drop one to two dkh a week it's um, quite the drag on the alkalinity so I've had to which is quite sensible use a doser and I figured out the amount it needs it doses at like eight mil a day going into here um, I use Aquaforest KH buffer and that's kept it really stable and since I've kept it really stable the system has just become better generally but also the macroalgae is more stable in its growth um, so alkalinity I think is actually more important than adding iron adding nitrate adding phosphate and so on and so forth all the things that people and myself used to get hung up on since the alkalinity is stabilized in my system this stuff is still important but it's not as important as that now what do i dose we've got everything here we've got um where is it ammonia phosphorus so ammonium phosphate now it's crazy isn't it you wouldn't normally add ammonia to a reef tank and you certainly wouldn't want to be adding phosphate but or phosphorus but i do um, i add that i also add magnesium nitrate so that's good there because magnesium is important to photosynthesis and plant growth or algae growth so is the nitrate so this is a good one to have magnesium nitrate I use this one which is a, an eBay company but it's basically got everything in there so that's your general bit of dosing if you want nitrates phosphates and potassium and then yes and then yes I do occasionally add tomorite this makes people laugh but I mean tomatoes love it and it's got everything that plants crave so I like to add this every now and then now there's a lot of overlap here a lot there's a lot of you know nitrates and phosphates in all of this stuff um, so it's a bit of give and take you get to know your systems and what they need I like to use Botrycladia as my indicator you can see here the tips are a little bit clear and they're a little bit washed out and when I notice that happening I know that they're kind of low on nitrate and phosphate and I'll, I'll dose one of those depending on my magnesium levels or if I just want one or the other. I just choose which one is the best one for that situation and then by a day or two after that the Botrycladia will start to go a nice red colour again. So it's actually quite interesting to use your algae as the indicator to tell you what they need. You have to understand it a bit but once you understand it you can look at your macroalgae and sort of know what the tank needs without even needing to test, which is quite a, uh, a skill in itself, but you will get there if you just listen to your algaes. While we're on water quality, I do regularly water change. I water change, I try to water change at least every two weeks, and I try and do about 40 to 50% every two weeks, which is expensive. And I know people bring me up on that, it is expensive, but, there are lots of things in salt water. There's lots of elements in salt water. And what you'll find in tanks that you only water change maybe 10% a week or something like that, you find that things, micro elements, which you don't necessarily test for without going, sending a water sample off to a laboratory, certain things will build up and certain things will deplete, but you'll never notice because they're not on the main test kits. So I counteract that by just dumping at least 50% of the water and then replenishing all those micronutrients which um, we don't really normally test for and that is enough to keep my macroalgae healthy it's enough to keep 
um, their requirements for nutrients in line. I don't think you need to do 100% water changes. Uh, I guess you could. Macroogas are quite tolerant to that kind of thing. But yeah, 50% is kind of what I do and it's what I've come to. I have in the past done less and I have in the past done more, but 50% is about right every couple of weeks um, just to keep them all healthy and in tip top condition. Another thing that is drastically important is having cleanup crew. If you can get dove snails, then absolutely stick as many of them in as possible. But also serif snails and your normal kind of cleanup crew is quite good. They're all hiding at the moment, but you know what I mean, all your, your normal snails and gribblies that you stick into your tank for cleanup crew, they are essential. You will find that certain species of cleanup crew can eat macroalgae, but I've never had an issue where they totally demolish an entire species. If you stick to the normal kind of turbo snails, um, you shouldn't have an issue. And to be fair, I do try and now avoid hermits because hermits prey on these and I just find them not of much value compared to something like a serif snail. In terms of caring for macroalgae, that's kind of it. There's a lot of nuance to it. I've kind of condensed it into not a very long video. My previous videos on macroalgae are still true. They're still valid. And if you want to know a little bit more about a certain subject, then do check them out. Fish wise, in terms of keeping livestock, you can keep most stuff with macroalgae. However, some things will eat macroalgae. Most tangs will, fox face will. That's why I've got a tang in here. There's also a fox face in here. I use this as my rubbish dump. So any macroalgae that I trim or you know I don't want it anymore, I just chuck it in here. And these guys will absolutely demolish it. That's why they're the healthiest tang and fox face on the planet because they actually get their, what I would assume, close to wild diet in this sump. They get lots and lots of macroalgae. When I bought this fox face, he was the size of a 50p pence. And that's a year and a half ago, and he's absolutely ballooned in size. So um, I put that down to what he eats, you know, he's, he's loving life in there. But otherwise, yeah, fish, doesn't really matter. Uh, I use mollies a lot, but yeah, damsels, the usual kind of assortment. As long as in the wild they don't eat macroalgae, you'll be totally fine to add them to a macroalgae aquarium. So yeah, I hope that's been a really helpful video. Growing macroalgae isn't really an easy subject and it's not something too easy to condense into what, a 20 minute video or so. So there's probably stuff I've missed out, but in general, this video can be used as a guide to grow most species of macroalgae. If you want to know any more, obviously I've got previous videos I've already mentioned, or you can leave a comment and I can um, try and help you out. If you've enjoyed the video, please leave a like and also subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. Once again, thanks for watching and happy fish keeping.